The Longhorns add two major non-conference games in the near future, and some fans are questioning why. We discuss on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns. You are Locked on Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, Texas will be playing Notre Dame in 2028 and 2029. Two more major non-conference games for the Texas Longhorns on their schedule in the near future. In the second segment, Five things we have learned about the Texas Longhorns two thirds of the way through the regular season. We've played eight games, four games to go on our 12 game regular season schedule. What we have learned about this Texas football team, a top five team in the country through the first eight games. And then in the last segment, not a great start for the Texas basketball team. Lost their first game in Vegas to Ohio State, 80 to 72. We discuss all of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So it is a very important day, and I appreciate y'all spending uh, at least 30 minutes of it with me today. And we're talking about Texas versus Notre Dame. It's been announced. I'm not sure it's been officially signed yet, but it seems like there's an agreement between Texas and Notre Dame uh, to play in 2028 and 2029 in the non-conference schedule. Just two of the marquee programs in college football two blue blood programs, two programs that you cannot tell the story of college football without. And so me, spoiler alert, I'm really excited uh, when you have these type of matchups, right? And to see Texas go against Notre Dame, obviously that's a, a little ways away, um, you know, four or five years from now, but you still expect Texas the way that they've built their program to be in, you know, the SEC championship and national championship conversations. And I would expect Notre Dame to be, even though they're not in conference in the, you know, playoff and, you know, maybe not national championship conversations, but playoff conversations. This should be good matchups, right? I don't expect it to be a really bad Texas team or a really bad Notre Dame team, but we have to see what happens by the time we get there. Nonetheless, right? These are the matchups that make college football. And I'm excited to play Notre Dame once again in 2028 and 2029. Now, when you look at the all time series between Texas and Notre Dame, Notre Dame has dominated. Of course, you know, some of these matchups go back to before any of us were even a thought, right? But they've played 12 times. Notre Dame has won the game nine times and Texas has won it three times. Now, the last time that these two teams played, right? I'm sure we all remember 2016, the first game of Charlie Strong's last season as the head coach of the Texas Longhorns. Texas won a thriller in the back half of a home and home. They got dominated the year before <laughs> in, in, in uh, Fort Bend. We're not going to talk about that one. Right. But in 2016, they won a thriller 50 to 47 against Notre Dame in Charlie Strong's first game of the 2016 season. The Texas Longhorns were ranked number 11 after that matchup. Things were looking up. And then they quickly went downhill as Texas went five and seven that season and lost to Kansas. But like I said, the last time these two teams played, it was a banger. And I'm expecting great things in 2028 and 2029 as well. Just to take a quick stroll down memory lane. All right. In case, in case you don't remember, these are some of the key players that were in that game the last time that Texas played Notre Dame. Shane Bouchel, I'm sure you remember this, was your leading passer. Tyrone Swoops had three rushing touchdowns. Deontay Foreman was your leading rusher, I believe 151 yards and a touchdown. I'm not sure if anybody's going to remember this. John Burt, right? Drop something in the comments if you remember this one. John Burt was your leading wide receiver, 111 receiving yards. And Chris Nelson was your leading tackler. So certainly a trip down memory lane. Um, one of the great games that we remember over the last decade for the Texas Longhorns. Uh, and yeah, some names you probably haven't heard in a while. Right? And so, like I said, it'll be good to, to see these two, you know, iconic Titan like programs in Texas and Notre Dame face off once again. And it continues to align with the philosophy that Chris Del Conte has had since he has been the athletic director at the University of Texas. Right. He wants to continue to schedule these marquee non-conference matchups 
for the University of Texas. Right. And I'll get to it, you know, in a little bit. But some fans are questioning, OK, well, if we're in the SEC and we're playing the likes of a Georgia, a Alabama, a LSU, a Tennessee, a Ole Miss, Texas A&M, insert team here. Right. If our schedule is already going to be strong enough just through the conference, like why are we not playing just whoever in the non-conference? Why are we essentially putting our playoff hopes at risk playing these super tough non-conference teams when we already have the schedule we need? We already have the strength of schedule we need in conference play. But once again, this aligns with Chris Del Conte and who he has been since he's been the athletic director at the University of Texas. So when you look at it, and of course, some of these games may have been scheduled before he started in 2017, um, but you had the home and home with USC in 2017 and 2018. You had the 2019 game against LSU, the eventual national champions. Of course, the 2020 game was canceled because of COVID. You had the 2021 game at Arkansas. Obviously, Arkansas weren't world beaters, but, you know, a big rivalry game, certainly a big non-conference game for the Texas Longhorns, probably a game most of us would like to forget. Uh, 2022 and 2023 with Alabama before we were conference opponents, of course, really kind of the first big game of the Steve Sarkeesian era or the first game where it kind of looked like Texas was turning the page um, in that 2022 game against Alabama where they lost by one point, you know, questionable safety and all that with Bryce Young. I'm not going to get into that, but you know, Texas certainly had a chance to win that game if Quinn Ewers doesn't go down. And then 2023, probably the biggest win of the Steve Sarkeesian era. They go into Tuscaloosa and Nick Saban's last year and beat the Alabama Crimson Tide. This year, we saw them go into Ann Arbor and beat the Michigan Wolverines. Next year, they will play at Ohio State, I believe, to open up the season. 2026, Ohio State will be in Austin, Texas, in DKR playing the Texas Longhorns. And then in 2027, Michigan will be in DKR completing that home and home, even though it's not in back-to-back -back years. They will be in DKR to play in Austin as well. And then now you have 2028 and 2029. You will be playing against the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Not sure which one will be in Fort Bend. Not sure which one will be in Austin, Texas. But certainly two great environments for two great college football programs that we will see in the next four to five years. Now, once again, we're getting back to the argument and fans are asking, when you look at some of the other teams in the SEC and the way that they schedule, obviously it's been a long time since Texas has scheduled an FCS opponent, but they still have usually on the schedule three FBS opponents that we know they should beat. Like this year, it was you know ULM, UTSA, and Colorado State. Even though they're FBS opponents, these are teams that uh, should not be competitive with Texas and were not competitive with Texas. And then you have to schedule, per SEC rules, a – power, I guess at this point, core four, right? Non-SEC core four opponent in your non-con. But when you look at a team like Ole Miss, right? They didn't schedule anybody. They played like Furman, like three schools you had never heard of, and then Wake Forest. So Texas essentially could schedule a ULM, a UTSA, a Colorado State, and then like a Michigan State. Or, you know, <laughs> right now it's on the schedule in 2032 and 2033, They'll be playing against Arizona State, a team like that, like a major a core four conference team that still isn't a world beater, that Texas could still go in there and beat by 20 to 30 points. Right. And so fans are asking, why don't we just do that? If we already have to play, like I said, Georgia, Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. And you're probably not going to get into the playoffs with more than two losses. At least it doesn't look that way this year. We'll see how it looks you know, in, in the future. Why would you make it harder on yourself in the non-con? I am a big disagreeer of that, right? I am on the side of Chris Del Conte. I want to see these big matchups, and I want to see the Texas Longhorns involved in these big matchups that make up college football. Once again, you have to schedule a core four opponent, right? Or somebody, you know, like Notre Dame. So, yeah, we could schedule, like I said, a Michigan State or Arizona State or a Rutgers. But you're not going to get up for that game. It's one of those scenarios where the fans, you know, think that they want something until they get it. And Chris Del Conte is kind of damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. Because the second that we start scheduling the weakest core four opponent we can find, along with three other opponents that Texas is obviously going to beat, then the fans are going to start complaining that the first month of the season is a wash and there's nothing to root for. Right. Of course, you're going to be excited to see your team, but nobody wants to watch Texas play four straight games where the opponent doesn't have a chance. You want to see marquee matchups in college football. So. 
like I said, I think it's a thing that fans are asking for that they don't really want. And if they got it, it's one of those be careful what you wish for situations. Second thing is, it's great for the fans. It's great for engagement, right? Obviously, the Michigan game, Michigan wasn't the team that they were last year, but that's a game we were excited about all season. That's a game that we were buzzing about all week. It was the game of the week in college football. You want to see your team in those type of matchups. As a fan, you want to be engaged in those type of matchups. Third thing is, Texas has a chance to win all of these games. What are we scared of? Like, Texas at this point has proven that they are an elite program. They haven't won a championship, but they've proven that they're one of the elite programs of college football. So when you look at Michigan, you look at Ohio state, you look at Notre Dame on the schedule. Yes. It's tougher than, I mean, I don't know, you know, UCF, you know what I'm saying? Or Cincinnati, but Texas has a chance to win all of these games, right? We don't have to back into the playoffs. We are the Texas Longhorns. What are you scared of? And then the last thing is Texas always, regardless of what happens in these games, has a chance to qualify for the playoffs with an automatic berth through the SEC championship. So I love the fact that we've scheduled Notre Dame in 2028, 2029. I hope that we continue to schedule these big games because that's what makes college football. The Texas Longhorns being one of the biggest programs in college football should play against the best teams in college football. Just because we're in the SEC does not mean we should try to back our way into the playoffs. And I'm so glad that our athletic director, Chris Del Conte, does not feel that way as well. A quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into the five things or five things I have learned about the Texas Longhorns through the first eight games of the season. All right, today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Return on You. Hey, Longhorn fans, it's time to recognize the Return on You Player of the Week. But Texas was on a bye week, so we don't necessarily have a Return on You Player of the Week. So far this season, we've pulled over $20,000 to support players on ROY or Return on You micro deposits lead to massive change with the ROY app. You can direct your support to the athletes you love, ensuring that all funds go to the specific player you choose. And unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going and you can receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season. The best part, it's risk free. If the athlete transfers or does not deliver the content, you get your money back. Right. Pay today. Celebrate tomorrow. Your support, your support sets your team up for success. Plus, don't miss out on Roy. Return on use exciting giveaway. Win two tickets to a game in November. Just download Roy, create an account and enter referral code locked on and you'll be automatically entered already on Roy. Any contribution to an athlete's campaign also gets you entered automatically. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. Download Roy now and join the NIL game with no subscriptions and no fees. And be sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at Roy underscore return on you for more info roy return on you support the players change the game all right five things five things one two three four five all right i just counted on my fingers if you're listening on audio but on camera the five things I have learned about the Texas Longhorns through eight games. Nothing I love more. It's just easy content than coming up with a quick list. And so, you know, I'm writing my notes down. Like, what am I going to talk about in the second segment? Obviously, first segment, Notre Dame. Obviously, third segment, Texas basketball. You know, who's going to be the middle child today? <laughs> right. And it's five things we've learned about Texas. So the first thing is, and we kind of saw this in 2022, right? Like in your biggest matchups, the defense balled out against Alabama, but the offense, blah. Defense balled out against TCU, but the offense, blah. And not hasn't necessarily been the case this year, right? Outside of Georgia, there hasn't really been a game where the offense was just blah. But what we're seeing is in the biggest moments and just overall, this is a defensive football team. This team, right? You can talk about Steve Sarkeesian, Quinn Ewers, all the weapons. This team will go as far as the defense carries them. When you look at the numbers, it's really surprising, right? Because people said, it, oh, it's just based on who you've played. And eight games through the season, you can throw that argument out the window, right? This defense is number one in yards allowed and number two in points allowed, only behind Army. And it's like, is Army playing the same amount of teams or the same quality of teams as the University of Texas? Of course not. But I don't hear anybody talking about Army being the number one defense and how they're fraudulent. You know, that'd probably be unpatriotic, you know, to talk about Army in that way anyway. But, yeah, like when you look at it, this defense is just balling out. This is a defensive football team. They are carrying this football team. They have showed up probably the only unit that you can say 
has showed up in all eight games this season. 17 turnovers forced in eight games. This is a dominant defense. They've dealt with injuries. Uh, they've dealt with new pieces, transfers, you know, playing true freshmen, huge rotations at certain positions. And no matter what they've dealt with, they have come in and played at a super high level. And I expect it to continue against Florida, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Texas A&M four teams that don't necessarily have elite offenses, right? So this defense should be able to impose their will. But even in the SEC championship, if Texas makes it there, even if the playoffs, if Texas makes it there, I think one thing you can count on going into these games right now for the Texas Longhorns is that this defense is going to show up and show out as they have done all season through the first eight games. Just a spectacular job once again by Pete Kukowski. They need to do whatever, right? Blank check to keep him at the University of Texas because eventually people are going to come knocking down his door. I remember in 2021, we wanted him fired, right? In 2021, we thought he was incompetent. Now he's leading one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the country. Just a spectacular job by him. The development, the coaching, it shows up every single Saturday with this defense. Number two, it helps to have elite talent at running back. Right. Steve Sarkeesian has had a thousand yard rusher every season that he has called offense. This may be the year that he does not get it. All right. I think Trey Wisner is somewhere in the 400 yard range. Uh, so I think he still needs, you know, <laughs> like 500 yards through the last four games of the season. But, you know, because of the playoffs, the SEC championship. Um, and I think they'll still be able to count stats in the playoffs, even now with the 12 team towards their regular, I mean, towards their, you know, season totals. So Trey Wisner may get there. Right. But it's questionable. It's really never been questionable in the past. Right. Jonathan Brooks, he didn't even start the first two games of the season. We knew he was getting a thousand yards. And then, of course, with Bijan, you know, that wasn't a question mark, but it helps to have elite talent at running back. We've always seen an elite running game at the University of Texas, especially under Steve Sarkeesian. And this year we have a good to great running game, right? And I do think that the offensive line plays a big part in that. The offensive line has to be better in terms of run blocking. And when you lose a guy like Cedric Baxter, who coming into the season was on the Doak Walker Award watch list, that's certainly an elite talent at running back that, you know, potentially you know, could have solved all of these issues that we're talking about or could have been in that same breath of a, a Jonathan Brooks and uh, B. John Robinson or Roshan Johnson. But we just haven't seen the season that we expected from Jaden Blue when Cedric Baxter went down. And Trey Wisner has been really good, especially over the last couple of games outside of Georgia. But there's times where Trey Wisner looks like just a guy right behind a really good offensive line. And so I think the running game has suffered because – Partly the running, you know, the run blocking has been inconsistent, but two, you don't have an NFL type guy in Jonathan Brooks, Roshan Johnson or B. John Robinson. And we're seeing the effect of that. Number three is that wide receiver by committee is cool, but it doesn't necessarily replace three high end National Football League wide receivers. And I think that's what we lost last year. Now, of course, a lot of this is because we've missed Isaiah Bond over the last three games. And that's going to hurt any, uh, you know, offense. But you look at it, Isaiah Bond has missed time. Matthew Golden, maybe he's been underutilized, but he hasn't had a huge impact on this Texas football team outside of a few games this season. Internet started getting choppy. I apologize for that. But, you know, I was talking about Isaiah Bond has missed the last three games. Matthew Golden has you know, probably been underutilized. Um, you know, he's had, you know, a few splash games, but nothing too crazy. You know, DeAndre Morris had a couple of games, John Tate Cook, Ryan Wingo. All these guys have had their moments, right? But it still feels like when you need it the most or when you need a huge play or when, you know, you're just talking about the talent at wide receiver, we haven't matched what we had last year in terms of, you know, Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, and Jordan Winnington. Have we lost games because our wide receiver court? Of course not, right? I think that they've been spectacular, and I think that Steve Sarkeesian has a done a good job of rotating those guys. but. When you look at it, I do think that we don't have the playmaking at the wide receiver position that we did last year. We have some really good guys, but we don't have an Xavier Worthy. We don't have an Adonai Mitchell. And I don't think we have a Jordan Whittington in this wide receiver core right now. I think that was just a different group of guys. Um, yeah, I think they were a special group of guys that we maybe even, you know, uh, underappreciated a little bit because now wide receiver by committee is cool. But like I said, I think Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, and Jordan Whittington just brought a different level of aura to this wide receiver core than we've seen this season. Of course, you know, with the caveat that we've been missing Isaiah Bond largely for the last three games. 
the defense getting back to them, they have a superstar at every level. Right. When we talk about defensive tackle, you lost to Andre Sweat and Byron Murphy. But I think Alfred Collins obviously hasn't played to the level that those guys did last year, which was just otherworldly. But he's been amazing this year. I think at the edge position, Colin Simmons, as a true freshman, has shown himself to be a superstar level talent. Anthony Hill, of course, at linebacker, one of the best players in the country, regardless of position at corner. Jade Barron moving to the outside, playing a lot more on the outside. He's been special. And then Malik Muhammad, you don't hear his name a lot because he's not giving up passes. Right. You know what I'm saying? He's been spectacular on the outside as well. And then at the safety position, Andrew McCuba before he went down. But Michael Taff has just been phenomenal in the last couple of seasons at the University of Texas. And he's only gotten better this year. A superstar at every level on this defense. And that's why they're arguably the the best defense in the country. And then the last thing is the quarterback play and offensive line play could be the Achilles heel of this football team when it matters most, right? For the most part, quarterback play has been amazing for the Texas Longhorns this year. For the most part, offensive line play has been amazing for the Texas Longhorns this year. But in the last two games where they've struggled, it's because we've seen a dip in the offensive line production and we've seen a dip in the quarterback production. This defense shows up in every game they play and i don't think that that's going to change anytime soon i think that's going to continue to be a theme for this season but when you get into the sec championship game when you get into the playoffs the thing that could hold texas back is once again like we've seen the last two games if we see a dip in quarterback play or offensive line play that could be the reason that texas ultimately gets sent home before they reach the championship or before they're hoisting that trophy at the end of the season Quick word from our sponsors once again, and then we get into Texas basketball's first game of the season. Did not go as planned. Lost to Ohio State, 80 to 72 in Vegas. All right, today's episode of Locked On Longhorns also brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That is FanDuel.com. Bet on your favorite team today. All right, so getting into the Texas basketball team once again. Lost 80 to 72 to um, Ohio State in the Legends Classic in Las Vegas. A lot of season to go. You know, you definitely don't want to overreact to one game, the first game of the season. And I know Texas was ranked number 19 and Ohio State wasn't ranked. So it's going to just appear on the surface as an upset. That's a really talented Ohio State team and a really well coached Ohio State team. And anytime in modern basketball, a team shoots 50% from three on that volume, they make 14 threes, you're probably going to lose the game, right? And that's what happened. Texas showed a lot of fight in the first and second half, but just could really never make up the deficit. And every time that Ohio State needed a big bucket, especially from the three-point line, they got it. So credit to Ohio State. Once again, don't want to make any huge overreactions to one game when you got 40-plus of them for the Texas Longhorns this season. And then when you're losing – you know, arguably your best player, maybe your second best player, you know, after what Trey Johnson did last night and Tremont Mark, when he's not playing, this is obviously going to be a different basketball team when Tremont Mark is healthy and playing one of the best scorers in the country. So, you know, we're not seeing the full version of this Texas basketball team anyway, and a lot of new players. So you're seeing them kind of, you know, figure out their roles and gel with each other. This is a team that's going to get better with each game they play. So three things I liked and three things I didn't like, right? No overreactions, just three things I liked and three things I didn't like from last night's game. Obviously, Trey Johnson looks elite already, you know, from day one. People have said that he may be the best player, most talented player we've had on the 40 acres since Kevin Durant. That certainly, you know, isn't too crazy of a statement (laughs) based on what we've seen over the last decade. And man. You know, comes in his first game, breaks the freshman's, you know, scoring record in their debut. Uh, I think KD had 20 against Alcorn State in his first year. Trey Johnson last night, 29 points, five rebounds and four assists, maybe five assists and four rebounds. I mean, you know, I can't remember how I wrote it down on 50 percent shooting from the field and 50 percent from three. He was spectacular last night. Just the shot making, the poise, the ability to get to the rim, the ability to get to his spots in the mid range and make his shots, the three point shooting, the creativity with the handles, the quickness. I mean, he was just electric. Right. And it's a blessing that we get to see him an NBA player, no doubt, at the 40 acres over the next couple of months. 
Second thing is I love the on-ball defense from Julian Leary and Kendall Weaver. I'm not sure. It's only one game. I'm not sure if, you know, Julian Leary should be our starting point guard or not. I thought he played better than Jordan Pope last night. And obviously Kendall Weaver, we saw it last year. Just two dogs on the defensive end really caused problems for the Ohio State guards at times in that game. Really love the defensive intensity they brought. That should be a staple for us this season. And I love what Arthur Kaluma can bring as a third or fourth option, right? When Tremont Mark comes back, you're going to have Trey Johnson. I think Jordan Pope will get more involved with the scoring. We saw him shooting some threes. And so on most nights, Arthur Kaluma will be your third or fourth option. I love his activity on the boards. Uh, love the ability for him to get to the rim. Uh, we saw him playing from the post. We saw him shooting threes, shooting the mid-range. He did a little bit of everything, four of five on shots inside the three-point line, did miss the two threes that he took, but still gave you 10 points and five rebounds, trying to figure out his role on this basketball team. So I just love what Arthur Kaluma brings. And like I said, as a third or fourth option, he's going to be tough to stop for the Texas Longhorns and can take a lot of pressure off of Pope, Johnson, and Tremont Mark when he's healthy. What I didn't like, a lack of attention to detail defensively in the second half, right? I thought that in the first half, Ohio State was just making some crazy threes, right? They're shooting from the logo, hand in their face, they were just making threes, right? You just kind of had to, you know, shake their hand and say, damn, you're making some good shots. In the second half, we saw some poor rotations, um, losing their man, inability to get a hand in the face, looking up like, oh, damn, I was supposed to get him. And then Ohio State was taking advantage of that cash and threes. We saw one play where Trey Johnson rolled his ankle, couldn't get over the screen, wide open three. Another play where Arthur Kaluma is just sitting in the lane, watching the ball. They throw the ball over his head wide open three right and so when texas was trying to make a comeback there were just too many defensive lapses in the second half that allowed ohio state to hold on to the lead and ultimately win the game that you need more from your bigs right that's the second thing Caden shedrick and zarik on yema right now look like a weak spot on this basketball team combined for four of 15 shooting and six rebounds right i mean your bigs your centers cannot shoot damn near 25 percent from the field right and if they are going to, I mean, you better be elite defensively and get boards. And they only combine for six rebounds. At this point, they need to be setting screens and rolling to the hoop. Right? That's At this point, that's what they need to do. Because four for 15 shooting from the biggest players on the floor is absolutely egregious. They need to be better, especially when Tremont Mark is out. And then three-point shooting continues to be an issue, right? This was an issue for the Texas Longhorns last year, just streaky, very inconsistent three-point shooting. I do think this team is a better three-point shooting team than they showed last night, but... You know, Ohio State came right out the gate and she made 14 out of 28 of them. So, you know, we'll see what happens over the course of the season. Outside of Trey Johnson, Texas was two of 18 from three, right? Take Trey Johnson out the mix, two of 18 from three. That is absolutely abysmal. You will not win a lot of games doing that. Ohio State was plus seven on the same amount of attempts. Watching that game last night, you would think Ohio State took way more three-point attempts than Texas. They both took 28 attempts. The problem? Texas made seven, Ohio State made 14, game, set, match. That's why Ohio State is 1-0, and Texas is 0-1. But, of course, a lot of season to play. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace.